Hello everyone and welcome to today's session, one of the most anticipated ones of the online lecture series. This session would be hosted by Supriya Paul, the CEO and co-founder of Josh Talk, a social tech startup. Supriya Paul is regarded as one of the top entrepreneurs in India and has featured in Forbes 30 under 30 Asia list and is an advisor of the Women Economic Forum. Over to you, Supriya ma'am. Awesome, thank you so much. Hi everyone, I would like to welcome you all to this online lecture series at TechFest. I'm very pleased to have Honorable Mr. Malcolm Turnbull with us today. Mr. Turnbull served as a 29th Prime Minister of Australia from 2015 to 2018. During his time as the Prime Minister, he delivered an economic growth agenda that led to record job creation at the back of cutting personal and company taxes. His government legalized same-sex marriage and reformed the school funding model to ensure a consistent needs-based approach across all school sectors. He has a deep interest in energy issues and was responsible for the establishment of Snowy Hydro 2.0, an important step in creating sustainable and renewable energy. At the time of growing nationalist sentiment across the world, he opposed racism and division at every turn, ensuring that Australia remains a successful multicultural society. Mr. Malcolm grew up in Sydney, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Laws from the University of Sydney. He was awarded the Rhodes Scholarship that allowed him to complete a Bachelor of Civil Law with honours from the University of Oxford. Prior to entering politics, he enjoyed successful careers as a lawyer, investment banker and even a journalist. On behalf of the TechFest IIT Bombay team, a hearty welcome to you, sir. It would truly be an honour to interview you today. Thank you for being here. Now I'd like to invite you to deliver a keynote speech. I truly believe your insights would provide a unique perspective to everyone watching this. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. It's, uh, it is a, uh, it's a great honor to be here today and I want to thank the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay for inviting me to speak with you. I only wish I could be there with you in person, but it is amazing to see how the power of uh, technology uh, can be harnessed to bring people together during this extraordinary pandemic. Uh, you know, we live in a time, a time of, in history of unprecedented change, both in its scale and its pace. And I think in many ways, the pandemic, which has inflicted terrible suffering around the world, taking over a million lives to date and, and in India, alone more than nine and a half million cases and 140,000 deaths or more than uh, that is, this has been, you know, a huge hardship, but it is also accelerated uh, change uh, and changes that were trending already have seen themselves brought forward. Um, you know, I, when I was prime minister of Australia, I used to say that disruption was the new normal and what I meant by that was that we had to make volatility our friend, not allow it to be our foe, uh, because that is the nature of the times in which we live. So we either take advantage of this volatility uh, or we let it run over the top of us. Now, at some point in the near future, I hope, we will return to uh, what we might regard as normalcy. Uh, we've begun to do so in Australia, as we're beginning to do so in Australia, it's worth asking ourselves, what is it that we're returning to and what kind of world we wish to live in? <clears throat> now, many of us here today <clears throat> have the great privilege of being in a position to shape the world, to design our lives and those around us. And that's where the great power of innovation, science and technology comes to bear. And that's a timely reminder with the Tech Fest today. Now, as you said in your introduction, and thank you for that, that was very generous. Uh, as Prime Minister of Australia, one of the first things my government did was to launch a national innovation and science agenda. I believe and still believe that innovation and science are critical ways of delivering new sources of growth, maintaining high wage jobs and seizing the next wave of economic prosperity. The NISA, as we called it, included a diverse range of uh, measures from helping to commercialize early stage 
uh, in innovations from unities, universities and research bodies to introducing tax incentives for early stage investors to ensuring we were building the necessary digital skills and pipeline for our economy through science and technology education in particular, uh, ensuring that we have more girls and young women studying uh, STEM subjects. We are, uh, that is a, a, an absolute market failure in Australia and in many countries where uh, tech uh, subjects, quantitative subjects in particular, are, uh, see uh, an over-representation of males. Um, you know, women hold up half the sky uh, and half the population and uh, should be better represented in the STEM subject. So that's a, that is an urgent priority and should be everywhere. Um, now, in terms of what, what this emphasis on innovation and science did, um, it resulted in a very substantial increase in the investment in startups every year of my time as Prime Minister. You know, it's interesting, uh, if you go back to the 1990s when I was involved in venture capital, then before I be, was involved in politics, you actually couldn't raise any money for tech in Australia. Uh, indeed, I was, I've always been a pretty entrepreneurial, enterprising fellow. And in the mid 90s, we were, I was involved in some rather esoteric mining projects, one of which was a gold mine in Siberia, which I guess you would regard as being at the outer edge of risk. You know, uh, Russia in the early 90s was, uh, in the post-Soviet environment, was a pretty dangerous place in many ways. Anyway, I had no difficulty raising money for a Siberian gold mine. However, we had at the same time a new internet company called Aussie Mail, which was at the time of a company we'd started, I'd started with a couple of friends, and that was the largest internet company in Australia at the time. It was a real business with hundreds of thousands of customers, you know, real revenues, nothing speculative about it. Um, but uh, we couldn't raise any money for it here. Uh, so we managed to raise money, uh, we had to take it na to NASDAQ in the United States. Now, all of that has changed and the those of, you, those of you that follow these things will know that the uh, Australian Stock Exchange is full of tech companies and the uh, pools of venture capital here are very deep indeed. And so there is enormous opportunity for cooperation, I would say, between Australia and India in um, technology, indeed in every other way. Um, one of my objectives as Prime Minister dealing with your Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, was to see if we could get a free trade agreement. But uh, I think as we saw with India's non-participation in RCEP, um, you know, uh, a scepticism about free trade is pretty deeply ingrained in uh, the Indian uh, political culture. But nonetheless, uh, there is just enormous opportunity for collaboration. Uh, you know, Australia is a very multicultural society, again, as I'm sure you know, uh, one in every 35 Australians are of uh, Indian origin. Uh, as it happens, Hinduism is our fastest growing religion, according to our census, uh, and Punjabi, our fastest growing language. So, you know, the reality is that we have uh, every opportunity for stronger and stronger cooperation uh, in every respect uh, between Australia and India it's actually been underdone, to be honest. I think we've had a, we've tended to have a, been mesmerized by the rise of China in this part of the world, and we've paid insufficient attention to the potential for collaboration between Australia and India. So I'm really delighted that that uh, momentum towards greater cooperation is progressing well. The, the quadrilateral, as you know, has been reinstated, which was one of my uh, agenda items when I was Prime Minister. I'm glad that's now been realised and I'm also uh, pleased that we now have elevated our bilateral strategic partnership to a comprehensive strategic partnership. Uh, we published, while I was PM, an India economic strategy, uh, all of which has, I think, under, you know, uh, underlined the importance of uh, greater cooperation. 
There is, of course, a new uh, four-year Australia-India Cyber and Critical Technology Partnership that's part of the CSP. Uh, that's going to be very important. Uh, again, a big part of my technology agenda as Prime Minister was cyber security. Uh, I, I produced, or my government produced, the first national cyber security strategy, and that is now a key part of actually my venture capital investing activity, uh, in, is, which is in cyber security. Companies like the Australian uh, bot elimination company, Casada is one of our portfolio companies. So, you know, I'm, I was delighted to hear of the success of the Joint Venture Research Academy between IIT Bombay and Monash University, which has so far delivered close to 400 collaborative research projects. So there's a lot of, us to, lot of work for us to do to collaborate together. I think the, the, the asset that we probably need more of is uh, more imagination in terms of how we can work together. I see the Australia-India connection as being enormous, you know, just having enormous potential. Um, you know, we have a, we have got everything going for us, I think. Uh, you know, there's a big Australian, you know, uh, Australian Indian community, if that's the right term, and that is growing. Uh, we obviously, uh, you know, many of well, Australians speak English and most, well, very large percentage of Indians speak English, probably much better than we do, I suspect. Uh, at least that's probably what um, the, one of the nice things about in, about English as a global language is that everyone thinks they they uh, speak it better than everybody else. Um, but uh, we've also, of course, got so much uh, so much in common. You know, I mean, cricket. But some of us aren't very sporty. But nonetheless, that is a huge uh, cultural inher inheritance we have uh, uh, together. So. You know, if, if when I was prime minister, I had a lot of uh, important strategic objectives uh, and engaging with our, with Southeast Asia and ASEAN and Indonesia in particular was a big objective. But as you would see, if you get a chance to look at my memoir, A Bigger Picture, you can see that the underdone India relationship was a key priority. So I just say to you, all of you, that the more you can do, to advance the Australia-India relationship, the better. It's uh, it's just for a bunch of reasons, uh, none of them very uh, compelling. It has been underdone. Now, the the fact is that you are all of you students today. You're the future. You know, I was talking to some students uh, only yesterday, and uh, one of them asked me, uh, "What advice would you give?" give us uh, for the future, you know, as to how Australia's future could be charted. And I said, well, you are the future. And, you know, you guys are the, are the future for India and indeed for the world, because you'll all be global citizens uh, and all working together with uh, young Australians and Americans and Europeans and Chinese uh, and many others from all over the world to collaborate. Technology is the key. Uh, you're at the cutting edge. There's never been a more exciting time to be young and entrepreneurial and, in, and particularly uh, to have great uh, scientific and quantitative skills. So I want to encourage you all uh, to play your part in this exciting future. And I hope that uh, greater cooperation and engagement between Australia and India will be part of it. And for my own part now, back in the private sector, I'm keenly interested in uh, that that collaboration uh, as I, you know, return to my old entrepreneurial roots as a venture capitalist. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you and I look forward to some questions and discussion. Thank you so much, sir. Um, you've already mentioned a lot of the points in your keynote, but just delving into some of the topics in detail. Um, during your second term, you extensively sought and campaigned for to legalize same-sex marriage in Australia. Yeah. What were some of the challenges that you faced during the same? And you know, how did you deal with the the prejudices that were prevalent in the society? Well, look, um, the yeah, I mean, my, my political party is the Liberal Party, which. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Australian politics, is really the Conservative Party. I mean, it's the centre-right party. It's the equivalent of 
the British Conservatives. So a lot of people in my side of politics were very uh, opposed to same-sex marriage. Um, I, you know, like David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, I actually think there is a very powerful conservative case for uh, legalizing same-sex marriage because unless you are, it, it, it's hard to find a good argument against it un, other than, you know, I, I was going to say good old-fashioned, I'd say bad old-fashioned homophobia. I mean, the reality is that commitment, stability, codependence are all things we support. And uh, so that's why David said, you know, I support marriage equality, not despite being a conservative, but because I'm a conservative. So uh, ultimately, we ended up having a national vote, which was quite interesting because it was a voluntary vote. It was, abs it was utterly unprecedented. It was a postal ballot uh, and 80% of the population participated in it, which is very big for a voluntary vote, as you can imagine, and about 63% voted yes. So after that, the political argument was over. So I'm, I'm not a great believer in direct democracy or plebiscites uh, unless they're constitutionally mandated. But on this occasion, it worked very well. And after that, it really was impossible for the reform to be resisted. So that's basically how we got through it. And how was the general reception amongst the masses? Among the what of, of legalizing mar marriage equality? Look, oh. yeah. I mean, Australians are very relaxed people. I mean, live and let live, you know, as a as a rather crusty old conservative friend of mine, who's quite a, you know, at least a couple of decades older than me, he said to me, he said, look, I don't care what people do as long as it's not compulsory. And it was, you know, it was, I mean, really, uh, unless you, you know, the, you know, the, I mean, there's just so much hypocrisy, as I used to say often that the most, in, the most uh, impassioned advocates of traditional marriage were generally, or not generally, were off all too often the most enthusiastic practitioners of traditional adultery. So, you know, as I used to say, this the issue is dripping with hypocrisy and the pools are deepest at the feet of the sanctimonious. So, you know, I think, I, I believe in, you know, live and let live. And uh, uh, if, if, you, if, you are, if you believe in um, uh, having a, a tolerant and respectful society that respects diversity, uh, then you, it's very hard to make a case against marriage equality, you know, but truthfully. The, I, I gave a speech, and I mean, you, again, there's bits of it in my book, but I gave a speech in 2012 about this issue, which where instead of approaching it from a rights point of view, because of like the classic way to look at marriage equality is to look at it from an equal rights perspective. Uh, and uh, the and that's that's perfectly valid. But I approached it from saying, well, what are the arguments against it? And I they're but they're very weak. You know, they basically get down to, you know, being uh, uh, a you know condemning homosexuality. Well, you know, it's a bit it's a uh, it's a bit late to make a compelling argument in that regard. I think in modern society. Okay. So you touched a little bit upon energy and, you know, as we all know, the world is currently facing drastically increasing energy prices, yeah. depleting natural resources and a serious threat to climate change. During your tenure as the Prime Minister, you proposed a national energy guarantee to address climate change issues and reform mm. the energy policy. Yeah. What, according to you, is the global importance of these reforms and is there a need to have similar reforms worldwide? to ensure sustainability? Yeah, look, uh, I, what's, what's necessary um, is cutting emissions, okay? Uh, how you do it, uh, what mechanism you use, is re doesn't really matter. I mean, it's just, it, it's the outcome that we've got to be focused on. So we've got to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And um, that, you know, that, that may involve a carbon tax. It may involve regulation. There's a there's literally an unlimited way number of ways of doing it. Um, the good news, though, is that we now have the means of doing it. Uh, you know, because variable renewable energy, 
solar and wind are now much, are by far the cheapest ways of generating electricity. Uh, so what you need to do then is plan that transition uh, so you replace burning coal uh, and gas and you know f uh, liquid fuels uh, with variable variable renewables but you've got to have the means of, of firming it or storing it or backing it up and you know that can be uh, batteries it can be pumped hydro uh, which I as you mentioned in your introduction I've I got started it's under construction now the biggest pumped hydro scheme in the southern hemisphere there's enormous potential for that in India I mean I know that hydro is very controversial in India um, but you know the great thing about pumped hydro is that you you know you you, you essentially just need two bodies of water with a difference in elevation and you can just keep cycling the water up and down and up and down it's not you know, it's a, it's a very, um, very economic way of storing energy. It's been around a long time. Uh, there is some pumped hydro in India, but, but I, think you'll, I think you'll end up building a lot more of it. That's certainly something I talked to PM Modi about because he is very passionate about solar. And uh, in fact, I joined the Solar Alliance that he established, um, which is a great agenda and and India certainly has great radiation resources as we do here um, but uh, you've got to store the electricity so the bottom line is with planning with engineering and economics as opposed to crazy political idiocy you can actually move to a, a net zero actually much more rapidly than you think um, but uh, but the key I think is zero emission electricity coupled with the electrification of the economy so that you use, you know, so that you move to electric vehicles. Uh, uh, and of course, you know, from uh, in terms of, I mean, India, you know, obviously has, you know, cities and areas which are, you know, more as technically advanced in every respect as anywhere in Australia, but it's also areas of, of much lower levels of development uh you know in in you know villages and uh that are not even connected to the grid now one of the great things about uh the whole uh renewable energy agenda is that you can have much more distributed generation you know you as you, as you know you know mm -hmm. solar solar panels plus a battery or plus some basic uh pumped hydro uh you can uh, you can get you can move away from the gigantic electricity grids which we've seen develop around the world uh, which obviously also bring with them enormous cost and vulnerability so bottom line is if we want to save the planet we've got to cut our emissions as urgently as possible um, the how, the good news is that we can do so and actually have cheaper electricity at the same time cheaper and more available electricity so that's the that's the great news it's one of the rare occasions where you can have your cake and eat it too absolutely so um, you know one of the issues which is uh, prevalent and growing in india um, is mental health um, and there is a huge stigma that's attached to it uh, especially post covid and with the lo lockdown there are increasing cases of you know depression and suicide amongst the youth in your in your book, uh, The Bigger Picture, you've touched a little bit about the phase that you were going through when you were battling depression. Mm. So what was that like and how were you able to seek help and get out of it? Well, um, it was very dark. I mean, the book is, is very, that, that was a very hard chapter to write. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But one of the at different times in my life, I've kept a diary. And uh, so having that, you know, there's a, it's um it's a terrific resource because all of us for, you forget things right uh but i i've got so there's a lot of my diaries in my memoir but uh i kept some diaries from when i was very very depressed and, and really getting quite suicidal uh and it's 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 actually it's quite chilling for me to, just to read them today but so what okay well, this is what i would this is the this is some wisdom I'd impart. I think that the first thing you've got to do 
is be as aware of your mental health as you are of your physical health. Now, some people, particularly young people, aren't aware of either because they think they're going to live forever and they're, you know, and they're <laughs> so fit and healthy. But, you know, I think most of us are aware of our physical health, whether we think we're getting a bit fat or, you know, we're not doing enough exercise and, you know, you can't run very far without puffing. You know, you, we're aware of our, our physicality, but we, most people don't pay attention to their mental health. So you've got to actually be aware, uh, aware of your mood. Uh, am I calm? Am I anxious? You know, and be alert to that. And then uh, if you realize you are uh, getting miserable, uh, take measures to address it. You know, you've got to sort of, I think vulnerability, you, I mean, one of the best bits of advice I had was from a friend of mine who's a psychiatrist. And he said, he said, he said, one of the key things is being aware that you are vulnerable to depression because it otherwise you can sneak up on you and you can just find one day that you are literally in the slough of despond and, you know, you, you can't hardly get out of bed, right? So I think being aware of it is important. And then you've got, there are many strategies to address it. Uh, some people use meditation. Others, a more simple thing to do is just to get up and get outside, get some sunlight. Uh, but just be aware of it. You know, don't, so that's, I think that's vitally important. Um, and I think, um, you know, for, for me, uh, my wife, the love of my wife, Lucy, to, you know, we're a very tight, if you've read my book, you'll know we're a very tight couple, but um, that was critical in pulling me through it. But I think, I think also just, you know, I just, I just decided that I was going to get out of it. And I, you know, and I, I think I, for a period I was, you know, that saying fake it till you make it. Well, I was, I think I was, you know, faking it for a bit, but then I finally hauled myself out of it, but it was, it was hard. But I, the most important thing is just to be aware of it. And you're right about the taboos and sort of stigmas and so forth. I mean, uh, you, we look, I mean, every, I mean, there are so many prominent people in history that have suffered from depression. I mean, Winston Churchill, you know, you know, was notoriously uh, suffered from that. And so many people in history, you know, Indian, European, you know, every culture has had, you know, mental, I mean, human beings suffer from mental illness, right? Like they suffer from cancer and heart attacks and all other sorts of diseases. So you've just got to be aware of it. And if you're aware of it, then you can handle it. And, uh, and also, I think the other thing I would say is be aware of your friends and family. You know, one of the best, we, we have a, an initiative here called Are You OK Day, spelt R-U-O-K, -okay, the letters. And it basically encourages people to just be aware of people that they're close to them. Because sometimes people, even in the middle of a big city, you know, can feel very, very alone. Uh, and uh, so reaching out and just uh, a bit of human sympathy can go a long way. Thank you for that. Um, you know, it's very interesting, uh, especially because we're talking to an audience who's in college right now, who is in the age group of, you know, anywhere between 18 to 23 or 24. You uh, worked in plenty of professions before you entered politics and as diverse as, you know, law, investment banking, venture capital and journalism. So, um, you know, what are the aspects of each of those careers that sort of you took with you to your tenure as prime minister? Or how did each mold you in your uh, journey? Um, that's a really good question. I think, I think journalism uh, was, was good because I learned how to write uh, and write, um, you know, write, I, I think, effectively, communicate well. I had a very, I had, when I was a young journalist on the Bulletin magazine in Sydney, I had a very stern old sub-editor. I'm not sure that they have sub-editors anymore, by the way. I think this is, this is in the digital age. This is all gone. But he was very, uh, he used to always chip me for writing long sentences. And, uh, 
you know, and, and, and you know, it's, it's quite interesting. I, I, you know, what, one of the best, one of the best um, lessons in terms of prose is, uh, is writing short sentences. My, my mother, interestingly, uh, was a university professor uh, in the United States and she, she taught, she was a prof professor at Rutgers University and her area was Victorian literature. Uh, and she's a, a rather remarkable woman in many ways. But anyway, one thing she did at her university, which was a state university and had a lot of undergraduates who turned up out of the American high school system, you know, who were barely literate, to be honest. Um, Coral actually recruited some sub-editors from the Philadelphia newspapers to actually just teach the nuts and bolts of English language. So I think that was very good. Law is obviously good for, uh, for um, uh, a good political background, particularly if you're an advocate. You know, that's, advocacy is something you get good at practice. Of, it's one of those things you get better at as you practice generally. Uh, and you see that in the House of Commons, by the way. I don't know if you've, if you, if you follow the British politics, but it's been interesting, you know, since Keir Starmer became the Labour leader in in the UK, how uh, the fortunes of the Labour Party have changed simply because you've got in him, and he's a barrister, you've got someone who can stand up and string three words together, you know, make a coherent argument. And, you know, as opposed to Jeremy Corbyn, who looked like he, you know, stepped out of some sort of Trotskyite, you know, uh, camp somewhere. Um, probably had actually known Jeremy Corbyn, but so I think that's all good. And, you know, business, I mean, people, pe in my observation, I'd say that business people think politics is easy and politicians think business is easy. And the reality is neither of them are easy. Uh, I do think politics is a, there, there are a lot of political skills and many business people never get them. But ideally, it's good to have people in politics who have done something other than politics. If you have your parliament or your cabinet composed solely of people who are basically apparatchiks who've, you know, worked in politics from, you know, their youth, um, you don't get that diversity of experience. So it's good to have a, if you've got a parliamentary system like you have in India and we have in Australia, it's good to have a mixture of life's experiences. You know, you want to have some policemen and farmers and soldiers and, you know, business people and, you know, engineers and chemists and, you know, you're always going to have lawyers, unfortunately, that's, you can't get rid of the lawyers. They're endemic. Um, so our last question, and I think this is something that all of us want to know is what are your views on the future of India? Ah, well, I mean, just, I, I'm a, look, <laughs> hugely optimistic and positive. I can't tell you the, but the, the goodwill that, that people in Australia, and I think, I think I'm very typical, the goodwill that people have towards India is just so massive, right? You know, the, uh, uh, India is a is a uh, subject of just admiration, fascination. Um, I can't. I think it was one of your historians. I can't. I'm not. I'm not getting this right. You can correct me. Um, said, described India as a uh, was it an unlikely nation and an improbable democracy, or maybe it was the other way around. But the Indian achievement is staggering. Absolutely staggering. You know, if you, you know, the country that. India is always compared with simply by virtue of its, you know, long history and, and population size is China. But, you know, China um, has been much more one nation for much longer than India has ever been. You know, it is, I mean, they have a, it's not as, it's not, it's um, actually, there's a very good book by a man called Bill Hayton, H-A-Y-T-O-N, called The Invention of China, which is just out, which if you're interested is, really worth reading on this but and that qualifies what i'm just about to say but i think you know the difference the 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 the, the indian achievement in bringing together uh so much diversity and maintaining a democracy however 
you know, unsatisfactory it may be. I mean, all democracies are unsatisfactory. Just look at the United States at the moment, where you've got, you know, the, much of the Republican Party trying to challenge the election result, which is staggering. Uh, but nonetheless, I think the Indian achievement is extraordinary. And I must say, I'm also a great fan of, and uh, I, ho I hope I'm not putting my foot wrong here, but a great fan of uh, William Dalrymple's histories. I don't know if you... Yeah, if yeah. You, no, I do yeah. follow him. And yeah, yeah, he's a great, because uh, he had a uh, he had an extraordinary collaborator, a very um, unusual, eccentric Australian guy who uh, was one of those extraordinary polymaths who, you know, knew read all of the all of the uh, sort of ancient languages, and so was able to translate so much of the. Uh, so much of the primary materials for him that enabled him to write those books. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for taking our time. Uh, you know, we've already exceeded the limit, but it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Yeah.